My name is George W. Howell, Jr., and I live at 2510 Redwood Street, Georgetown. I graduated from Columbia High School in 1941, and on my dad's birthday, December 7, 1941, was Pearl Harbor. I was drafted in 1943, and uh, I drafted in at Fort Jackson, Columbia, and I went from there to Fort Knox, Kentucky for training. I trained in tank division, and I moved from there to uh, uh, Camp Campbell, which was near Nashville, and stayed there just to follow up, you know. And then I come over to the east and was shipped to England, and I was in England on D-Day. And uh, after they established the beachhead, I was sent over, and I was assigned to the 3rd Armored Division in the 1st Army. And I went from uh, through France, Belgium, and to the Elbe River and met the Russians. On the way over the one time, we, my division had to stop and, and meet Patton, go down and meet Patton and cut the Germans off of their big push, you know. So that's basically wh where I was. And I, uh, when the war ended, of all things, I was with, with the tanks and the trucks that we had, and I rode in a truck. I had to, they, they of course, with all the mud and things we went through, they had to have chains on that. And of all things, on the day that the war ended, I was had several chains to the back of one of those uh, Jeep, the Jeep. And I, I, I had to drag them down the cobblestone street and trying to knock the <laughs> rust off of them. And one time when I was going back t to take the ones I had back and pick up another bunch, Lieutenant motioned for me to come over to him. And I drove over by him. He says, well, I'm glad to tell you the war ended today. I went on a ship, of course, and uh, I, the last few days on the ship, well, we got kind of rough, and I got a little bit sick, not too bad, and but I was able to get off of the ship in England, and I stayed in England, and uh, training, of course, until until D Day happened. That's basically what the trip that I made. And when I went over, when uh, I went to uh, Normandy after they established the beachhead, I, they sent me over in the ship, of course, again. There was a lot of, lot of tanks and, and different equipment that was, had been shot up on the beachhead there, and a few in the water out there that they, they, they damaged or stopped, and it didn't look great at all. They told us that we needed to uh, use a little pup tent, put up a little pup tent, two of us together, and to dig us a foxhole, because they said, bed check Charlie will come around tonight and drop a bomb. And bed check, check Charlie, of course, was one of the Germans. And that was uh, uh, something to try to get on your nerves, you know. And so me and my buddy, we took a shovel and started digging the, a Foxhole, and that ground was tough in this world. And uh, he, the fellas next to us, they threw the shovel down and said, I'm not going to dig no hole. That says, you know, if they drop a bomb on you, it'll get you anyhow. The only trouble with that is, if, if it wasn't right directly on you, shrapnel couldn't get you if you was below the ground. And my buddy and I, Hard as it was, we still dug 
us to Foxhole. Well, guess what happened? That night, Bed Jack Charlie hit the ammunition dump and such shooting and explosions and things going on. Whew, it did. that was scary because didn't know if they, it, we were being bombed or shelled or what was happening. And uh, so, but finally when it went over, when it, we got over, me and my buddy got out the foxhole and got back in, lay down. And uh, in a few minutes, I I was about to go to sleep, and I heard some noise outside, and I wondered why it was. And I looked outside, and those and those two fellows were digging their foxhole. <laughs> they decided it was worthwhile. <laughs> and we went from there. We we got they bombed uh, Saint Lo. And. Uh, we started started with our tank division, Austin Tank Division. Uh, we started pushing the Germans, and we we pushed them. We moved against them pretty fair, pretty fair, because they bombed them pretty hard. And so we we went, with a few exceptions, we went all all the way to Germany. Not too much. We had some, yes, some, but but uh, the thing of it is, I was in the tank division. I mean, I was in the truck behind the tanks and carrying the ammunition. And the, the thing I always uh, thought about when I have to give those fellas ammunition when they get low on ammunition, I'd have to give them out the back of that truck. And I thought many times, brother. If a shell was to hit this thing, they wouldn't be able to find a piece of me. And so, I. Uh, uh, but we we went on after we got through the Siegfried Line. We had them on the run. Siegfried Line, of course, was the Germans' defense line. Right. I can tell you a little kind of funny thing. It wasn't funny then, but we were had the Germans on the move. And we were moving along in convoy, and we decided to uh, take a break, and the convoy stopped. And we pulled in close to as close to the house that we was right by as we could. There wasn't nobody in the house because they vacated it. And so, soon as we stopped, almost they started shooting and carrying on, and somebody hollered a German plane. And act, act, and everything was going up there, and we, and we, uh, I decided I was going to get on that fifty caliber machine gun and join in it, you know. And so I got up there and got the gun kind of in place. And after after a while, I saw the plane getting closer. And you know, every third bullet was was a tracer, you know. So you side, you side. You sighted it by that tracer. And so I got that thing lined up about the time I thought I had was lined on that uh, plane. I pulled the trigger. And all of a sudden, all kind of things started falling on top of that truck. And I thought, sure, did they, they were strafing or bombing <laughs> that area. And guess what it was? I shot the end of the house off. <laughs> and the shank was flopped up near and come down. <laughs> it was just funny now, but it wasn't funny then, I'll tell you that. <laughs> the tank would, was ahead of us, of course, when, and we were falling behind. We'd, all we were in, trying to do was stay up with them and keep the ammunition, and I saw a lot. We had to. What we did is we cut the the plan was to with the Germans was to a, a troop go this way and another that way and cut them into small small uh, bunches, see, so we could take care of them. And we and with our regular tanks going along, they could shoot them and pretty well get them out of the way, so we didn't have too much trouble with them.
we were in this that place and uh and spent the night in a field there and uh the next morning the Germans made it made a counterattack and they started shooting and we had to go around trying to give some of the tanks some ammunition because they're getting low and when I got to the last one we were going to service when I started to jump after I'd given some ammunition when I started to jump out of the uh, back of that truck all of a sudden one of the Germans shelled or something hit that tank knocked it over and knocked that guy that was standing up by it sprawling and all and that was scary I took off and got down got I jump, I was jumping down I saw it at the same time I was jumping out of the truck and so I decided to run and to get to lower ground to get out of that area and I did but we got through it all right and no more nobody else got one right at that particular time we would have to go that's another thing that was the most dangerous one of the most dangerous parts that we as as, as truckers had had to worry about because when the troops had moved on and cut them off and had them in little groups here and there maybe one tank one german tank cut off somewhere and but they're moving so fast till they get low on ammunition and the and the the ones that gave us the uh, uh, ammunition that kept up with the ammunition they were behind us and they couldn't stay up with us and we'd have to go sometimes we'd have to go a good ways back and of course one german tank could tear up a, several trucks if they if they didn't have any protection around them. and so that was a little danger we had as a matter of fact one time and one one particular time i remember i think there was about 10 trucks and for some reason i didn't have to go i'd been on guard duty or on something that night and uh so excuse me and uh, so uh they uh, 10 trucks went to go get some ammunition only one got back i would get in the back of the back of the truck and the tanker we we try to get as close to the tank as we could and the tanker somebody from the tanker one of them would be there and i'd hand it to him and he'd put it in the tanks when the war ended we met the russians and kind of but let me just mention this the russians uh the germans were more afraid of what how the russians would do to them than they were us and they rather surrender to us than they would the russians and so we got and we had to wait about two weeks for the russians to get to the other side of the river and meet us people with so many points a certain number of points could be discharged first in the first group it just so happened that i didn't have i liked about two or three points of being able to come in the first group and that worried me a lot but a lieutenant come up to me one morning and he said hey i looked and saw that you took accounting in high school he says now a sergeant is going in the first group that handles the supplies orders supplies from back or front or wherever and see he says and i'd like to give you that job till your time comes up if you well me i was pfc then i was glad to take that because that meant that i wouldn't have to be doing guard duty and all that stuff you know and so i said yes i'll take it i was a pfc now i took that job that i went and worked with that fellow for a couple of weeks and then he left and i took over and before i could hardly turn around here <laughs> just so to speak uh they made me a sergeant and then a little bit later when they that first group got going pretty well and they were getting the second one up they came to me and asked me if i would like to if i'd like to if i'd stay with them they'd make me a first sergeant i said thanks but no thanks i'm going home and i come back to i come back to uh and landed in new york there in there 
that place that they, where their ships come in. And so I, uh, they took me and I went to, where was it? In North Carolina, that, that big place. They took us there to the army. And that night, I was, they were writing our discharges. And it was late. We got there kind of late. And uh, it was time for them to knock off. And, and the officer, whichever it was, I don't remember, he came out to us and said, now I'll tell you something. He said, fellas, if you will, if you will let us take the easy way and not worry about getting all your uniforms, they're supposed to replace, give you so much of that, you know. He said, if you not worry about that and some other little finer things, he said, we'll, we'll just discharge you tonight. Will you have any idea what we said? And so, so uh, what they did, they lined up, they lined at the table, and they got the, the, the medic got on the other side of the table, they had a lot of them there, and we'd come along with our shirts up, and they had those, they had a needle and one of those little things that you hook under there to catch, instead of going through that fancy stuff, you know, through your arm and all that, they'd put, stick that needle in your arm and let it come into that little cup. But we didn't care about that, we didn't mind doing that. And so about 10 o'clock that night, got discharged. No, we had to get home on our own. I didn't, I didn't let my folks know that I was exactly when I was getting home. I kind of wanted to pull a surprise on them. And uh, so we, uh, there was two, there were some fellas from Mullins that wasn't too far from where I, from where I lived, you know, but still, I didn't have any way to get home, so they told me to go and spend the night with them. I spent the night with them, and the next morning I got in, I got out there on the highway and thrown away in the Conway. And I, and I thought that I was going to put a surprise on my aunt, my, on my dad and mother. It just so happened that dad's brother riding by saw me standing on there, and he recognized me. And it, when I got home, they knew all about me being there. I was going to pull a surprise on them, and I was the one who got the surprise. <laughs> oh, after the war, I, I went to Columbia, to Jones Business College, and took a complete business course without shorthand, and graduated from there. And, uh, and then I came home, and in 19, probably about, I believe it was 48, I went to Georgetown and applied for a job and worked in a furniture company for three years as the office manager. And then the automobile dealer, Chevrolet Olds dealer, Mr. West, hired me to be the uh, office manager, credit manager and all. A bunch of titles, but not too much money. And <laughs> strike that out. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, and uh, I started working there. I was, and I was the credit manager, and I had, that's quite a job when you're dealing with people and some of them won't credit and the credit won't stand it. You have to tell them no. But anyway, I worked with that for 18 years. And then Georgetown Steel, built a, a plant, steel plant, and after they built it, they built, started building one in Andrews Wire. And uh, what Andrews Wire would do would take their steel and draw it down to sizes for different kinds of steel, you know. And I got hired there. I was, I was the uh, treasurer there, and I worked with them for 18 years. And then 
I uh, left in 87, 87, I retired, and, but retirement didn't last very long, I started working little odd jobs here and then, I worked for about five more years at different places, as a matter of fact, uh, I worked at a, the Buick place for a couple of years, they knew that what kind of experience I'd had, so they hired me for a couple of years, and then, since then, I've just been uh, pretty well on my own, and I do, uh, I sweat it out uh, when I see all these prices going up, and mine doesn't go up uh, any, you know. I come, when I come to Georgetown in 1948, pretty soon I met a, a lady that I'd known. My dad was a minister, see, and at one of the places he went, we knew Edna Pope that worked around Georgetown. We knew her real well, and she told me she she had a girl that she wanted me to meet. So I uh, I said, well, fine. So we were invited to play, to sing, me and my cousin. I played the guitar. As a matter of fact, I've got a 60-year-old guitar, Gibson guitar, over 60 years old. And so we got up and sang that night. And after the service was over, Edna said, I want you to meet, I want you to meet the lady I told you about. And so she introduced me to her. And she said, she plays the piano. I said, let, let's go up and let me hear you play the piano. And she went up and I liked the way she played it. But anyway, we went on a date or two and Edna, Edna asked me one day, says, uh, how did you like how did you like a day? I said, Well, fine, she's a fine girl, fine lady, but she's too tall for me. She's a little bit taller than I was, you know. <laughs> and so I but somehow or other didn't stop us. But we we broke up down the line and one day I was sitting at home in a chair, and my dad, who was always uh, full of a little mischief, you know. I was sitting there, I don't know what I was thinking about, if I was thinking about that or not. But anyhow, he's, he's, he come by and he said, son, he said, if you could see her this morning, she wouldn't look about that high. <laughs> but, to make a long story short, I married her and we've been married almost 58 years. One daughter, and she, uh, and she uh, uh, married a cozy, and they had one child, one daughter. So I've got one grandson and one great granddaughter. War is terrible, and I hate the, the destruction that it causes. But I was glad to, for us to get out of war, because war was terrible. We lost a lot of people in World War II. And, uh, and I was, I knew that if anything would stop, it would be with it, those bombs. It, they didn't drop the two of them before the Japanese were ready to call it quits. It killed a lot, but it, it didn't kill as many as would have been killed if they'd kept right on fighting. I tell you, I felt like that. It was my duty, just like it was others, to do my part. And even though I was small, I still was did my part. I I weighed a hundred and ten pounds when when they checked me out. And I'll tell you a little funny thing that happened there that I don't care know where you want to put that on or not, but. Anyway, there's about four or five good-sized guys that led a kind of rough life around in the neighborhood where I lived. And when they, we got on the bus to go to Columbia, to Fort Jackson, they said, they said, you don't run, you don't have anything to worry about. 
She said, you never pass. I believe I was the only one that did pass. <laughs> I don't like the way the, the war is going now. I'm not, I, I don't really, I don't know how you feel about it, but I don't like for these fellas criticizing everything and talking about it, how it was, and they talk about Bush has done such a sorry job and all. They don't know what they're talking about. If we'd, if we'd really, if we'd really bomb the stuffing out of them and kill a bunch of them and stop it. I hate to say that, but I believe that's what would stop it. I think the country is going, one of my expressions, Mike, is hog wild. When, listen, when I, when I came along, when I came along as a young boy and came along to the, there was very few children that didn't, didn't, that uh, didn't behave real well. And if they did do right, they'd get a whipping. But now you, you almost have to get an order from the government before you can whip one. And I think things this day and time is, is too easy. Our country's going for a lot. And another thing, the morals is going down the creek terribly. You know, when you th when you think that uh, you see them, I dare say just about half of the people that go together have a child before they ever get married. And and I'm sorry. I hope I don't hurt anybody's feelings when I say this. But now they're even getting trying to promote the gay mess. And so I'm not particularly pleased with things like that. The Bible talks about the day Armageddon and it talks about an antichrist coming. All right, now here's, here's my opinion about along that line. I think we're headed in a bad direction. We're going down from the greatest country and the strongest in the world. We're, we're getting to where uh, um, but that's the only way, with this country as strong as it was, that's the only way Antichrist could take over. And I think, I think we're heading for, for Armageddon, really. But there's still, I'll still say this, there's still some good people in this world. And I, I wish we'd love our neighbors ourselves. 